Welcome, I'm Julie Hyman, anchor at Yahoo Finance, and you're watching Verizon's Ready for Anything commencement series. This is going to feature industry titans across business, nonprofit, and sports. This series just came together from one simple question. What can we do to have real conversations with students during this really challenging time in our world's history? The answer was to provide you with direct access to people we admire over uh, the next couple of days since we're coming to the conclusion of this series. These leaders are going to share their top advice with you and then be open to any question that you might have about the future. And I'm sure you have a lot right now. While we know this isn't exactly the graduation celebration that you imagined, we hope you'll find value in connecting with some of the greatest minds and problem solvers that we know. Throughout this series, please do send us your questions in the comments. You can do that, again, in the comments section on LinkedIn by sharing your name as well as your university and your question. We will get to as many questions as we can during each of these broadcasts. Now, I mentioned the titans from various areas. Today's titan is from the world of nonprofits. You likely know the music festival that he created, Global Citizen, which is now happened in cities around the globe, not just New York City, but also London, Mumbai, Hamburg, Toronto, Berlin, Johannesburg. The festival began back in August of 2012 to coincide with the United Nations General Assembly. But it's not just about a concert, of course. It's about fighting poverty. It's about eradicating diseases like polio around the globe. And Hugh Evans is the gentleman behind all of this. Uh, Global Citizen, by the way, is just the latest move in a career that has been spent fighting pover poverty and being an advocate for various uh, causes. Over the last 10 years, Global Citizens have taken over 24 million actions in the fight against extreme poverty, driving financial commitments of $48 billion. That's uh, impacted the lives of 880 million people around the world. So graduates of 2020, I bring you Hugh Evans. Hugh? Thank you, Julie, and thank you so much, Verizon. It's such an honor to celebrate the graduating class of 2020. I know this isn't how any of you had pictured this day going, graduating in the midst of a pandemic, an economic crisis, and the overwhelming anger and grief felt around the world in response to the systemic racism we've witnessed across this country. But this is an important day for you, for your families, your teachers, and everyone who supported you through your academic journey. And I'm thrilled to be sharing this significant milestone with you. My name is Hugh Evans, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Global Citizen. And today I want to speak with you about finding purpose and the promise that you hold to make the world a better place. Indeed, our generation has the power to help build the world back better than before with freedom and justice for all. What I want to share with you today is simple. My conviction is that being willing to embrace the unconventional path in life, living with the risk of failure, and learning from your mistakes, and dreaming big and activating those dreams, even when it seems that all the cards are stacked against you, which is what I'm sure many of you are feeling right now, are three of the most important tenets in life that you can possibly hold to. This conviction has led me to a number of realizations. Firstly, that the most memorable journeys in life are unexpected and often very unconventional. When I was 14 years old, and in high school in Melbourne, Australia, a lady from an aid organization called World Vision came and spoke at our school assembly. She challenged us to go without food for 40 hours to raise money to support their work. As a 14 year old student, I was quite an eager young guy. And so I put up my hand to get involved and my school became the highest fundraising school in the country. So through the generosity of World Vision, I traveled to the Philippines to see their work firsthand. And there was one night in the Philippines that changed my life for Ed forever and led me to start my life's work. I was taken into a slum in the center of Manila called Smoky Mountain. It's an entire community built on top of a rubbish dump where the very infrastructure of this whole community revolves around scavenging. So the children literally run after the garbage trucks every single day and they try to get bits of scrap metal, piece of food and things that they can recycle, anything that can be useful. 
That night I was placed in the care of a family living on the slum with a boy my own age named Sonny Boy. We were both 14 at the time, but where I'd come from, you know, middle-class Melbourne in Australia, he'd been living his whole life on this slum as a scavenger running after those garbage trucks. And he took me to where he lived and we cooked a meal together that night. And I was so naive, I didn't know what to expect when it came time to go to sleep. But when we finally went to sleep, we simply cleared away the pots and pans and we lay down on a concrete slab around the size of half of my bedroom, seven of us in this long line. And I'll never forget lying there that night with a, with a smell of rubbish all around us and cockroaches crawling around us. I didn't sleep a wink, but I realized it was pure chance that I was born in Melbourne and Sonny Boy was born here in Manila. It is the lottery of life. That night changed my life forever. And I returned from the Philippines and I was deeply inspired by the work that Mother Teresa was doing in India. And I said to my mum and dad, I'd, I'd love to go and work at Mother Teresa's orphanage in India. My parents weren't very excited about that idea. And I remember my mum said at the time, she said, Hugh, are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into? I said, mum, of course I do. I'm 15 years old, come on. And I started trying to persuade her, but they, they weren't so convinced. And so I made a deal with my parents. I said to them, if I can get a full academic scholarship, would you let me go? They agreed. And that was the start of a very intense year for me. In between regular bouts of food poisoning, I studied at a school in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains. And on the weekends, I volunteered with Mother Teresa's orphanage in Dehradun, India. It was amazing, challenging, difficult, sometimes frightening, and sometimes very lonely. Emotions I'm sure many of you are feeling right now. And it changed my perspective. I traveled to India very much as a self-conscious teenager and I returned with the realization that over 700 million people on our planet live on less than US $1.90 per day in extreme poverty. And I realized that we wouldn't solve this through charity alone. We needed systemic change to address the reasons why people are poor to begin with. And we needed a movement to call on world leaders to invest in health, in education, in water and sanitation, in food security and in equitable opportunity for all. This realization set me on a course to confront that challenge and inspired me to build and co-found the global citizen movement. We are currently facing enormous challenges as a society, from battling COVID-19 to fighting racial injustice. Yet I remain hopeful that we can improve the state of our world. This is gonna be one of your generations greatest challenges. Living a life on an unconventional path is bound to test your character. Going against other people's expectations of what a young person could or should do with their careers or what is a normal career path can put things into perspective in a way that reveals our greatest hopes and our greatest ideals, especially when the kind of uncertainty we currently face has never been seen before. But I want to commend you for finishing your studies amidst these challenges. And I urge you to realize the power and purpose you now have. Higher education is about learning how to make a difference in the world, both individually and collectively. For it was out of my unconventional journey, sleeping with cockroaches on a garbage dump in the Philippines, a young person completely out of my depth in India, that I resolved to start a movement of young people committed to changing the world. This leads me to my second lesson, that through my experiences, I've learned that you are, you are on the edge of breakthrough when failure is a real possibility and sometimes a present reality. I would even venture to say that you are on the, bed, the edge of breakthrough when failure is highly likely. And no story illustrates this more in my life than the story of founding Global Citizen. 11 years ago, with a group of friends, we founded Global Citizen in Australia and London. But I knew we needed to be in America if we were gonna build a global movement. So in September of 2010, I moved to New York to start a new chapter here in the States. On the first day, 
we landed in New York. I was doing a talk at Columbia University and I met a guy by the name of Ryan Gall. Ryan had this great vision to take an example of the concert that we held in Australia and host a huge global citizen festival in New York City. We wanted it to be iconic, unique, and inspire people to take action to achieve our mission of a world free from extreme poverty. At this time, Global Citizen in the US was headquartered literally in a broom closet in another company's office in Soho, which one of our friends had generously donated to us because we couldn't afford any rent. There were a handful of us and we were an entirely unknown entity in the US. Initially, we were planning to do a concert at a stadium in New Jersey, but we were then introduced to a man named John Silver who manages the Foo Fighters and he challenged us to secure the great lawn of Central Park on a Saturday. The only problem is that there had only been one other concert on the great lawn on a Saturday since Simon and Garfunkel's performance back in 1981. I had no idea how we were gonna pull it off. We met with the parks department, the mayor's office, and amazingly, after we spoke to them again and again and again, they granted us the use of Central Park. So then the Foo Fighters confirmed, then the Black Keys, K-9, Band of Horses, and things were looking up. We signed on a major bank to help fund the event. And then all of a sudden, they pulled out. That weekend, the bank had lost millions in earnings due to the financial crisis. They canceled all of their sponsorships, including ours. The risk of failure was so real that I could taste it at the time. It was literally six weeks until the date of the show, and we didn't have a headlining artist for the concert, and we were $1.5 million short of pulling it off. But we, grit, we gritted our teeth and we pushed ahead, and through our passion for seeing a world free from extreme poverty, amazingly, somehow the risk paid off. Through a connection made by a good friend, we met with Sumner Redstone, who owned MTV and Viacom, and he generously wrote a check for $1.5 million on the spot. And that same day, I raced to a meeting with Neil Young's manager and Neil Young agreed to headline the festival. We even had a surprise performance of, Gen of John Legend by John Legend on that night. And so four years after coming to New York on September 2009, 2012, as 190 world leaders gathered in for the UN General Assembly, we had 60,000 global citizens show up on the Great Lawn of Central Park for a massive advocacy event. And we achieved $1.3 billion in new commitments for our charity partners and other causes related to the end of extreme poverty. And possibly more important than the festival itself, we had started the global citizen movement. And now, close to 10 years later, we have had Beyonce, Jay-Z, Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift, Justin Bieber, Coldplay, Ed Sheeran, Pearl Jam, Billie Eilish, Lizzo, Alicia Keys, Super M, Shakira, The Rolling Stones, Paul McCartney, and an incredible list of the world's greatest artists helped bring Global Citizen around the world through the Global Citizen Festival under the curation of Chris Martin of Coldplay. And our events, such as One World Together at Home in April, to support frontline community health workers fighting COVID-19 broke a Guinness Book of World Records for the most money raised by a virtual concert with $127.9 million commitment committed and was seen by over 300 million people in over 160 countries around the world. Looking back, perhaps some would say it was all too risky. If the first global citizen had failed, it's quite possible that our organization and everything we'd worked for would have imploded. We put all of our eggs in one basket. We played all of our cards in one hand. Wise people have often told me that when it is hardest, that is when you're closest to breakthrough. And I believe our society is at a moment of inflection and hopefully a moment of breakthrough. We are on the cusp of a great restart and you are at the center of it. Every moment counts right now and failure is not an option. We need to fight to create the world we want, a world of justice and equity of opportunity. So when you find what it is you believe in, 
that purpose that drives you. I want to encourage you to be willing to put everything on that on the line to achieve your higher goal. The story of Global Citizen is the story of dreaming a big dream and holding on to it. Nothing great comes without perseverance. This is something you know all too well. Here you are on the verge of your graduation after years of grueling hard work, successes, setbacks, perhaps even some spectacular, spectacular failures and today finally victory. Perseverance in the pursuit of big dreams pays off in all fields, whether business, entertainment, civic engagements, sport, the pursuit of an idea in the face of all odds is what separates those who achieve great things. This year hasn't turned out like all of you would have wanted it. And I can tell you that it may feel like it isn't getting e any easier in the days ahead. But I can also tell you that persevering through this time and raising your voices is well worth the effort. So the next time you're at that moment when you think that all is lost, remember that something is great is often waiting just around the corner. Taking the unconventional path, embracing failure, persevering with your dream, I believe that these three elements are key to all great human progress. Now, I acknowledge that it can be hard these days to stand up for what you believe in. The political landscape is polarized. Racial injustice is everywhere you turn. Standing up for anything can lead to critics and detractors. All the more reason to be assertive, to be bold, and to use your voice to affect change. Say clearly that Black Lives Matter, that the status quo is unacceptable. You will inspire the voices around you to speak up to, because some issues really do transcend political lines. They go beyond conservative or liberal, Democrats or Republicans, the left or the right, they are universal. They are issues of freedom and liberty, as we've seen demonstrated by people all over the world marching in the streets, saying the name of George Floyd and others. They are issues of equality, like the end of apartheid, and they are issues of justice, like the end of extreme poverty. Today, you are under so much pressure to conform, to do the safe thing as we face an economic downturn and continued uncertainty due to COVID-19. But I wanna encourage you to take the unconventional path and you are never too young to begin. For when Mother Teresa was only 12 years old, she felt a strong call to be a missionary in India. And at the age of 18, she left her home to join with a community of nuns with a mission to fight against poverty. And she changed the world for the better. When William Wilberforce, an activist in England, was only 25 years old, he started a movement to abolish slavery in England, and he succeeded three days before he died. And we no longer accept slavery to be part of our world. And when Nelson Mandela was only 26 years old, he joined the ANC Youth League and ultimately, ultimately went on to end apartheid in South Africa. And we no longer accept apartheid to be part of our world. I believe the class of 2020 has it within you, the power to truly do something great. This is your moment. You've had the strength to push through the enormous challenges we are facing to achieve this significant milestone. This is now your generation's opportunity. Together, we can leave a legacy that changes the world for good. And we need you. Thank you and congratulations to the class of 2020. Thank you so much, Hugh. Um, really inspiring. Your story is to the graduates, really to anyone who is trying to make a difference here. I just want to remind our graduates, uh, if you're watching on LinkedIn, you can leave a question there for Hugh in the comments and I will 
then ask him on your behalf. When you put your question is, please put your name as well as your university so that we know uh, where you are in the world, since obviously a lot of folks are watching from around the world. But uh, before we get to, actually, let's get to some of those questions now. Um, Hugh, I, we got a question from Eric that I think really speaks to the themes that you were talking about. So. Um, he asks, how would you advise and encourage students looking to enter nonprofit humanitarian work? Where should they look to make the world a better place and affect real change? Well, the great thing about nonprofit work is that uh, it requires the same skills as the commercial world. So given that you've you know, been trained either in a discipline such as law or or, or health-related matters such as medicine or engineering or marketing or public relations or a diverse range of skill sets. All of these skill sets can be applied to the nonprofit world. For example, in our organization, Global Citizen, we have tech engineers. Um, we, have, we have extraordinary marketing people. We have extraordinary event producers. We have extraordinary field operators at our offices in, in South Africa or in, in Nigeria. And so I would start by asking yourself, what are you passionate about? And are you interested in creating change locally or helping people in other parts of the world? Because if you have a sense of what sort of change you wanna see, that will help refine your passion. My dad, my dad once said to me, I remember this was the best advice he gave me. He said, Hugh, do you want to impact a small number of people in a very impact, in a very, uh, like a uh, high intensity way, or do you want to impact a large number of people, perhaps not with that same intensity, but try to change policy. And for me, it was about policy change. So I studied law. I then went to Cambridge to do a master's in international relations. And that discipline helped me create global citizen. So I'd encourage you to ask questions about the local versus the global, because they interrelate with one another, particularly right now, as we're seeing with COVID-19, but also ask what are your, commercial passions? Do you love to work in, you know, do you love to work in healthcare unit? Do you love to work in marketing? Do you love to work in communications? Once you have a sense of what those passions are, study those disciplines because they will, they will equip you perfectly to enter the nonprofit world. Hugh, uh, Matt writes in as well to ask how you have personally been dealing with the challenges of the pandemic and the climate of pro protests and demonstrations, especially as they're happening at the same time, how do you stay sharp and energized right now? Well, firstly, Matt, thank you for that question. I, I couldn't, I mean, this is a very, very hard time. And as I said earlier, these we live in unprecedented times when we have the challenges of an economic crisis, a political crisis, uh, a pandemic, or also, coupled with the, the crisis of racial injustice. These are all happening at the same time. And so graduating during this time is incredibly challenging. The first thing I'd say is that racism is really the antithesis of being a global citizen. So our organization condemns discrimination and marginalization based on, on race, race, ethnicity, or gender anywhere in the world. And we celebrate, we encourage the right for peaceful protest and promote civic engagement, whether that's voting at every level around the world, or whether that's campaigning on the issues that you're passionate about. That's what we encourage our staff to do, and I'd encourage you to do the same. It's really important, though, I always say, to ask the question of what outcome are you trying to seek? So before you get out there and use your voice, take a step back and do some research and ask, where will your voice be most effective? For example, are you trying to seek immediate justice? Are you trying to deal with the systemic challenges? Are you trying to promote civic engagement by getting people to vote, for example? Or are you, or are you looking at the intersectionality of all of these issues through, for example, a lens like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? If you have a sense of what sort of change you're trying to see, it will actually help you in your focus and in ultimately in achieving your outcomes. So I'd encourage you to ask the outcome question first and drive from there. Hugh, you mentioned perseverance earlier. So here's a question that speaks to that. Um, Hannah writes in to ask for advice for when no one will respond to any job applications during the pandemic for new graduates. Well, Hannah, firstly, I wanna say um, 
you know, you, you have an immense courage already for, for, for enduring this time. So all power to you. Um, but the second thing I want to say is that I often find that at the time when it's the hardest is the time to try to get creative, try to stand out from every other application. I, I often find that the people, when they reach out to me and they really want to get through, they, they ping our organization through multiple channels. So they don't just submit it through a job application website. They find out who runs the HR department and they reach out to them. They find out who are the friends of people who are associated with the organization. They reach out to them. So try all the unorthodox paths at this particular point in time, because this is the time when you can see um, whether there are opportunities. And I can tell you, even in the midst of pandemics, organizations will be hiring. You know, our organization is still growing even at this time. And I know many organizations that I speak to who are at the forefront of social change right now are growing during this time because people want to create change. So I'd encourage you to, to try to find organizations that you're passionate about. And, and reach out to the head of HR, reach out to their colleagues. Don't go for just one um, particular uh, channel through a formal pathway, but try the unconventional pathways as well. Um, this is related, I think. Jamel Walker from Crichton University says, do you have any specific suggestions for a graduate who wants to work for herself? And obviously you were starting a, a nonprofit, but you work for yourself effectively. And so I wonder what lessons that you've had and experience that you could share. Well, working for yourself, I mean, as an entrepreneur myself, I, I've always found that I, I did want to work for myself. I, 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 as I said, I studied law and I did my summer clerkship at a law firm and I loved working with everyone. But I knew as an entrepreneur, I wanted to create something. And so my advice would be, and, this, and I touched on some of this in my speech earlier, that it can be incredibly, incredibly challenging in the early years. I do remember when we were working literally out of a broom closet in Soho in New York, I felt many, many days like I had no hope, but it was just the sheer belief in our mission that kept pushing me through. We, um, as co-founders, we didn't weren't paid a salary I think for the first three to four years of the organization's growth, we're effectively working for free and we were losing money because we had to pay all of our phone bills and everything else along the way. So it was, um, it was grueling. And it's hard to look back now because our organization has grown to where it's become and it feels like a million miles away, but it was really only 10 years ago. And so my encouragement to you would be, if you want to do something and work for yourself, Firstly, start by identifying your passion, identify your field, and identify a unique value offering that you can bring to the world. Because if you have that unique value offering, that's going to really help you differentiate yourself from others. And then I'd encourage you to find as many people around you who can, who can work with you and volunteer. I, I literally remember the first time when I started, because Global Citizen is the second organization I founded, the first organization I founded was called Oak Tree in Australia. It's a youth-run aid organization. And I remember the first person who was our bookkeeper was my best friend at the time, Richie, because he happened to be much better at math than anyone else was. And so you end up finding people around you when you're really young that just believe in you, but, but be confident in your mission and endure despite the fact that it's going to be a very hard journey. It is very rewarding being an entrepreneur because you get to forge your own path and it's often, you don't often get to see the fruit of your labor till much, much later, but it is definitely worth it. And if you feel like you have that entrepreneurial flair, I would strongly encourage you to pursue it. Yeah, we've got a question about leadership from Jason. How can leaders and role models be effective during times like these? How can students identify good leadership? What makes a good leader? Well, I think leaders, play an important role, especially in times of uncertainty. I um, believe that effective leaders are confident in their purpose. They're very clear in their communication and they actively listen to those that they're seeking to serve. So seek out those you respect and learn from them. But remember that leaders exist in many forms. In fact, I'm certain that many of you 
here today are leaders yourselves in your own disciplines. Leaders, um, and, and really, and treat this as a lifelong learning opportunity as a leader, but particularly at this point in time, because there's so much noise in our society right now with so many enormous challenges going on, my strongest encouragement to you is, is seek clarity of communication. If those you're working with understand what matters most and what doesn't matter as much, that helps everyone move forward. For example, today at Global Citizen, we had a whole team meeting and we knew we've only got a few weeks to achieve this really important goal that we're working on now. So we spent the whole hour as a team, it was about 25 of us on this phone call, just talking about how we would achieve one single outcome together. We brainstormed around that goal. And I'd encourage you as a growing leader to just be really focused on what matters most and what can wait till later. I think we could all use that kind of advice. <laughs> Hugh Evans, co-founder and CEO of Global Citizen, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your experience with us. Um, Audacity is a word that kept coming to mind as you were speaking and telling your story. It's uh, it's a great one, and I hope it inspires our graduates. So we really appreciate your time. I wanted to let everyone know that we will be concluding this commencement series tomorrow, and we're ending it with a bang. I think it's safe to say you can join us at 11 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. That's Friday. And we'll be joined by Hans Vestberg. He is the CEO of Verizon, as well as former president Bill Clinton, they will be offering their remarks to you. So please join us back here then. Thanks again to Hugh Evans and hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you, Julie.